All right, welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today, our guest is Gregory Griffith. Greg is a teacher of 29 years, a high school coach, a band leader in professional entertainment, and a marathon runner, having completed well over 15 marathons now. He's the author of two books, a speaker, CEO of the Omni Griff Corp, a serial entrepreneur, multi-entertainment company, and real estate investor. He's married, he has two kids. I could just keep going, but let's get into this. Greg, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Tyler. How are you, man? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm excited to hear your message. Let me hand you this virtual microphone and the floor is yours. I got it. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say first and foremost, man, I was blown away. I went to your podcast. I went to your previous VSA when they interviewed you. And I'm just being honest with you, man. I couldn't believe how many similarities that you and I have. I was like, wow, man, this, what are the chances that you're a teacher, I'm a teacher. You're a marathoner, I'm a marathoner. You're an author, I'm an author. You, you're a dad, you're a husband. You know, you have your kids, your son's wrong with you. My son, Jonathan, my youngest son, believe it or not, I don't think I shared that with you. When I started teaching at Flanagan High School, my first year in, I started coaching cross country. Long story short, my son Jonathan came to my high school as a ninth grader. He hated running. He didn't want to do it, but he's a very athletic kid. He'd been playing basketball and soccer from the age of, what, six, seven years old. So he came to high school still playing basketball. And I said, Jonathan, listen, this is a great conditioning sport. You know, I had to get into the psyche of why I wanted to make it work. Long story short, you tell me your son's running. You know, you tell me you did your ultra marathon. Your son went out and ran with you. Now, just happened last week, believe it or not, let's fast forward. He was a kid, 14 or 15. He hated running. Guess what he just did last Sunday? My son ran a half marathon off the record on Lauderdale Beach. See what I mean, man? You never know when you're planting the seed what might happen. And I didn't have to say, come on, Jonathan, come on, Jonathan, come on, Jonathan. He actually just, he was very motivated. As a matter of fact, his fiance, that young lady in college, She's studying to be a doctor right now. They actually ran it together. And that mm -hmm. really just blew me away. I, when, he sent, when he sent the text to me and I looked at it, Tyler, I stopped for a moment and I flashed back to Flanagan High School, 1997. And believe it or not, to segue about that, at the age of 43, I ran my first marathon. I've done 25 marathons now, wow. you know, and I've been running them, feels like forever, but I'll never forget how many times people said to me, man, are you crazy? You're over 40, you want to run a marathon? <laughs> and you know, something just, something inspired me. Proud to run my first marathon. All I did in the Tampa Bay area was run the Gasparilla Distance Classic, like a 10 Ks, you know, 5 Ks. And something in me said, you know, I walked out of my classroom one day and I saw the cross country guy with about 40 kids, more than half of them girls. And, uh, and I say, wow, man, what's going on there? You look like you use a little help. Long story short, I started coaching girls cross country. Cool. And that was my incentive. I found myself running 30, 40 miles a week with the girls. I said, you know what? If I can run like this, I think I can do a marathon. And don't get me wrong, I'll talk about it a little later. The field monster was on my back saying, no, you can't. You're too old. You can't. What do you mean? You're old fart. You can't run. You can't do that. And, and, and I had to just go with it myself. And a long story short, man, I ran that first marathon in 1997. It was a Disney marathon. I did it in three hours and 40 minutes. And, and to this day, every year for more than almost 20 years, man, I, I've run a marathon. And in some of those years, I ran more than one. And I, I'm, I'm not speaking to the choir because if you and I have any similarities, but there's something about it. And what I want to share with the students today is that anything that you can attach to from a mind body and spirit perspective i know you were saying in one of your podcasts that you're right you, and i'm going to concur with you to the extent you spoke about balance that no one ever gets balance but one thing we can do is stay in active pursuit right. and that is the thing that young people need to understand that you got to find balance in your life in mind body and spirit and for me i found music at a very young age then I discovered that I, I'm, I'm an athlete also. I was football, baseball, basketball, man. Really into it, swimming in the local pool a lot. And, and I just, I really discovered running. 
And, and when, I tell, when I tell people, you're never, ever too young or too old. One of my students at Flanagan High School, man, ran his first marathon at 15 years old because he was so motivated. That kid came back to me as a cop and hugged me and said, man, you inspired me to do this. See, little moments like that for me, I, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. They, they, they're, they're imprints for life. You know, I've had other kids. I'm a special needs teacher. I didn't acknowledge that. I have a master's degree in exceptional student education, ESE. And those are kids with significant cognitive deficits, uh, emotionally handicapped, Down syndrome, a lot of autism. I'm, I'm, I'm huge on autism family. I'm a big advocate with best buddies. And I'm here to tell you, man, the spectrum is so broad. It's such a heterogeneous nature that you, you find that you're gonna have impact in manners that you never ever would imagine. And Tyler, I'm telling you, when a kid comes back to me, even some of the ones who even got themselves in trouble, a kid wrote to me from jail once. I hated to hear that he was in jail, but it was just the fact that he was in there, I mean, in, re, in, re, you know, in rehab for himself and he made it out. And he said, man, I got your book back then. You were one of the greatest inspirations to me. So for me, 29 years teaching, this is my year to retire. I'm my 30th year, I will always reflect upon making a real, real big decision about where to go in my life. And I wanna share with the students today this. At some point, we all get to what we call the fork in the road. And when you're gonna leave high school, it's gonna be so critically important to me. I, I just think that, that you've decided what you have truly a passion for, what you wanna put your purpose into, should I say the activation mode. This first book right here, I think I shared it with you. This is my first book. This one is Activate and Stagnate is why, why I gave you that title and that theme. That, to me, is what it's all about. I have these A to Z strategies. There are 26 of them, just like the alphabet, just like a marathon. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put it out there right now. It's probably going to be, I don't know, probably by the time I finish this school term since we're on virtual school, but uh, how to run life's marathon to be successful. 26 ADG strategies to success. And I'm gonna share them and I'm gonna pop into a few of those while we're discussing this right now. But what I wanted to share with you is this. When someone discovers a passion, they discover a purpose. When you find a purpose, you find possibility. And that would be letter P from one of those strategies that I'm talking about right now. Live your life with passion, you'll automatically activate your purpose. Now, all of us are gonna find jobs, we're gonna find things we need to do, places where you want to go. Yeah, there's a difference in you doing that. One thing I'll say that was a common denominator for me. It was a big decision for me to become a teacher. My undergraduate degree is in business administration from Florida a &M University. And when I graduated college, the only thing I ever done in my life was play music. I worked at McDonald's. I did part-time jobs. I did different things, man. But the real job in my life, I've never had work for anyone other than this job as a teacher and an entrepreneur in my own business. And the reason I'm saying that is that when my, when my brother gave me his trumpet at the age of 12 years old and said, I know you want to play music. I know you want to learn music. Take this trumpet and start. Automatic connection, Tyler. Passion. Just, just, because I do remember when I couldn't go, -da 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 -da, I could not play an eight note scale, man. And the next thing happened to me in my music endeavor, my brother came to me the same way. He gave me a bass guitar at the age of 16. And my point to all of this is that I just I attached to it. It just became part of who I am. I went to college, I had my initial major was, was economics and minoring in music. And I found out that, you know, supply and demand, the gross national product and all that good stuff was not me, but I wanted to be in business for myself. So I got a degree in business administration. But I had this theory, if you go in, if you're fired up, if you focus, if you're steadfast and you're faithful about it, it's gonna work for you. And man, I managed to work in the business department, play in my band on the weekends with a 20 hour load and got my degree in four years. So when I tell people, Find something you love to do, you really want to be. It's never too early and it's never too late. Like you heard me say earlier about finding myself running a marathon at the age of 43. Age 43 was a very pivotal time for me in my life. I had made a lot of decisions. I had to determine what mattered to me. But even prior to that, 
when my son was born in 1990, you know, I had to determine at that point in my life, I said, I've been a, nothing but a full-time musician, a substitute. I had my degree in business. So I was running my entertainment company. And, you know, at that point, I was working six nights a week. I was a band leader. I was the guy who wrote all the checks. Believe me, man, I had the headache, you know. But at the end of the day, I had to make some decisions. I was saying earlier before we stopped that I had uh, two sons. And I, and I had to make some decisions. Do I want to still be in the position where I'm constantly just behind the eight ball trying to take care of my family, or do I want to find more stability? And the one thing that was told to me, you get a degree, the chances are in your lifetime, you can earn a million dollars. I don't know if you heard that or not, just like becoming an expert, you got to put in the 10,000 hours. And something said to me, it was like a trigger. I mean, I'm going to tell you a little story real quickly. What happened to me one night was this. My son was only about maybe a month, two months old. He was born February 27th, 1990, Tyler. And at the end of the day, I went to do my job at a club one night. And I wrote about this in my first book. I walked into the club, I worked there six nights a week, long story short, the club owner comes to me and tells me, hey, listen, man, uh, your agent is gonna book you at another club and we have an opportunity uh, to bring in this great road band and we're gonna put you in this club next week. So after you finish this week, you know, talk to your agent, he's gonna put you somewhere else. Granted now, here's my son, a month old, I got a seven piece band, I got all these people that I have to take care of. I got a wife who's on pregnancy leave, just had a baby. And, and, and now, you know, next week came, you think I had a job, Tyler? Nah, didn't have a job. Uh, now I had to make some major decisions. And that was when I decided to get a master's degree in education because I've been a sub teacher. And I said, what can I do? But I don't have to give up my passion. And, I, and here, here I am, I decided, well, and, I, and, and the fear monster that I'll talk about in a few minutes was on my back. Can you get in graduate school? Can you pass the MAT, Miller Analogies Test? Can you get through that GRE? And, and I'll be very honest with you. I, I, I literally decided to maybe retreat from that. But something inside of me, something inside of me just spoke to me and said, the only limitations that exist are the ones you place upon yourself, Greg. If you say you can, it's a sure shot that you won't. But all of you just say you think you can. And well, my friend, that was back in 1990. I went to graduate school uh, the fall of that year. The next year I graduated, I went to graduate school eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock for 52 straight weeks. The year that I graduated, Hurricane Andrew, one of the most catastrophic hurricanes to hit South Florida, came here. All of the schools in Dade County where I was living in, Hialeah, Florida, which I'm sure you've been to Florida, you know about, wiped out. So that took me to Broward County. And my first teaching job in 1992 landed me in the Coconut Creek High School. And a long story short for you, the story I'm telling you right now is about focus, focus, focus. It's about taking action. It's about being an activator, advocating for yourself. If I could say anything to young people right now, of course, there's a lot of verbal abuse going on. Bullying right now is huge. We have a job, bully box note. You can drop in right at the beginning, front door of my high school there. And, and I'm here to tell you, it gets full every week. So, so anyone can try to talk someone out of what they're trying to do with their lives. And things can happen over and over and over and over again. And just like myself, I was almost talked out of, out of being able to do what I'm telling you about right now. But guess what it did for me? Back to what I said earlier. I got that degree. I was able to provide for my wife at the time, for my son. I didn't have to give up my love for music, like you telling me about how you were just finding things along the way concurrently with, with teaching that you could do. And I, back to you and I again, my friend, it, 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 it just blew me away. And I said, wow, man, this guy's had to do the same thing, make the same decisions I had to make. And I'm here to tell you, man, once I got in the classroom, I realized, wow. And this book came from my work in the classroom. Every day I wrote to these kids, about who they are, where they are now versus where they could be. And I started getting a lot of journals. And I realized one day, Tyler, wow, I got hundreds of these. I took the best 30 of them, I put them in the book. Hmm. I, I, 
once again found the focus. I got fired up. I stayed steadfast in my faith, and the rest is history. And just yesterday, or two or three days ago, I logged onto the computer, and I want to share this with these students out there. And there was an article on Warren Buffett. I'm sure you know who Warren Buffett is. Some of them may or may not. But just for the record, I think he's the second wealthiest or in the top 10 of the wealthiest men on the planet, if I'm not mistaken. And a long story short, he said this, and I really want to share this right away. It's not about every time someone asks you to say yes, you have to learn how to say no. And until you really learn in high school, what's your priority, how to be a peak performer, how to maximize your day, you're just gonna fall for every little thing and everyone that comes along. And I know because of bullying that we spoke about earlier, people would do that. Peer group pressure is powerful, especially in this special needs population where I've been teaching for almost 30 years now. And I'm here to tell you without a doubt, Warren Buffett said this, Write down the 25 most important things you like to do in your life. When you write those things down, quickly erase 20 of them. Eradicate them. Take them off the slot. And then narrow it down to the five that matter the most to you. And say yes to everything about them, but say no to everything else that will be a deterrent that will cause you to default, that will cause you to activate or either procrastinate to the point that you stagnate. And he used Steve Jobs as an example of what Steve Jobs, and I'm sure if you don't know who Steve Jobs is, the guy that formed Apple. So at the end of the day, his, his major, major thing was I had to find focus. So take action, believe in yourself, be bold as a lion, Know that you have courage and confidence. Always know you have a dream and a desire. Be personally empowered with relentless enthusiasm. You're gonna have a dream. But a teacher told me one day, Mr. Griffin, your enthusiasm is contagious. And from that day to this, I, I just know that being empowered with enthusiasm will energize you. It will keep you excited about where you want to be and what you like to do. Remain fired up, remain focused, and be steadfast in your faith about whatever it is that you want to accomplish in your life. And if you walk in my classroom every day, we have a sign right above the blackboard or the board there, excuse me. It says, I'm not here to be average. I'm here to be awesome. And every day, man, my little kids, and it may, it may seem a little funny to you, but the ones who can barely speak, the ones who can stand up, the ones who can't, the ones who can do anything to be a part of it, I go to each of them and I say to them, you're not average, you're here to be awesome. And awesome is also related to the fact that, you know something, you're unique. For every one of the students I'm speaking to right now, let no one ever tell you that you're not here to make your contribution to this planet. I don't care how minimal it might be from a microcosm to the giant macro of becoming the president of the United States. Let no one tell you that you're not here to make your unique contribution. And if kids can do that, they can understand that they set realistic goals. If they can understand that the relationships they develop in their lives, there's a guy that Robert Luman knows, and I'm going to give him a plug. His name is Simon T. Bailey. I, you probably may know Simon Bailey. Let me tell you something. He says something in a keynote that I went to for Robert Luman about two years ago. Relationships are the new currency in America. I'm going to say that one once again. Relationships are the new currency in America. Actually, globally, no matter what happens out there, someone is going to be instrumental to you getting to the next level. If you're the smartest person in your circle, you need some new friends. It's just that simple. Get to know people who, want, who, who are going to be instrumental in elevating you to the next level. And life truly is about the next level. My A to Z strategies are very simple. I went through about the first, what, four or five of them just now. A, B, C, D, E, L. The letter G to me is probably one of the most important. And if you notice, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's the seventh one. If you take seven days of your life and say, I'm going to take action. I'm going to believe in myself. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm here to make a contribution. I got a burning desire and a dream. I'm personally empowered with relentless enthusiasm. I'm fired up and I'm focused. And I'm going to take this 30-day challenge to set a very realistic goal. Remember the subtitle to that book that I said to you, 30 Days to a New You. 
no matter what, some of the greatest in history use that as their template, 30 days. Check the generals in the armory or Franklin calendar. I was just reading about v -shed. I don't know the guy's name either, Tyler, but the gentleman has this, this supplement called Test Boost. And what it does, it, it, it takes care of everything in your stomach that you don't need that would allow you to lose weight and move forward. And, but he said, you got to do it 30 days. So let the genius set a 30-day goal. Let the genius know that the genius comes to play and greatness will manifest itself. Let the genius says that never, ever forget to be grateful and show your gratitude. If you take that first week of those first seven letters and implement those strategies, you'll find that you're just going to move along. You're going to be happy. You're going to always go to bed in life to hit a home run. You will always know that you're given innate, intrinsic, innate, intrinsic, inherent, inborn ability to be whatever you want to be, and then they become your IPs. And that letter I is your intellectual property. Tyler knows what I'm talking about. He's a serial entrepreneur like myself. He's got multiple platforms that he can launch himself from to make money. I do too. I'm a full-time teacher. I run a full-time entertainment company. I've authored two books. I'm a real estate investor. I have several million dollars in real estate right now as we speak that one day I woke up, Tyler, and this is the absolute truth. My 60th birthday, I decided, because I want to stay with this about goals and dreams and passion and purpose. I just said, I want to get into real estate. And I was only a full-time musician at that time. I came on for one of my gigs late at night. And I don't know if you ever heard of the guy's name. is Carlton Sheets. There's a guy named Carlton Sheets. And there's a guy right now who's emulating him named Ron LeGrand. They are real estate investment gurus. You come home late at night, it's 2 or 3 in the morning. You're tired from a gig. This man would be on every weekend, every night. If you buy this program and you follow my strategies, you can be successful in real estate. Tyler, I looked at that package, I bought it, I stared at it for probably six months to another year. And one day, I became the activator about real estate. That was in 1997. To this day, I thank God that I did that. In my heart, I knew that if I just try what this man is saying, I can do this. I went out and bought an apartment building with an actual, uh, uh, what is that, like a laundry room? Owner finance, no banks, got the building, kept it 20 years. I just sold that apartment building two years ago. I don't even want to tell you that I made in equity from that one transaction as a real estate investor more than what I bought that building for 20 years ago. And I'll share that with your audience because what am I saying to you? I love real estate. Equity is king. I have a passion for it. Hit the home run. Use your intellectual properties. I stop right there. Develop them. Yours might be, who knows, you might be a great chef. You may become a teacher, a lawyer. You may become a policeman. You may become great in athletics. You may become a singer. You may become an actor, an actress, an artist. Everyone has to find their little light under the sun, no matter how you look at it. And a friend of mine told me this a long time ago. And let me tell you what happened to my, to my son's cousin, He's 27 years old, speaking of real estate. Listen to me, Tyler. And he blew me away. He's 27 years old, already working in corporate America. He's about to retire before the age 30. He owns 50 properties in the Indiana market. And he said, guess who inspired him? Uncle G. Mm -hmm. He said, Uncle G, you were buying real estate when I was just a kid, eight years old. Do the math. This, this kid is three years younger than my son, and he comes every year and hang out with me and my son, Jonathan, and he would go around to the apartments with me, go to my rehabs, and Tyler, you know something, the point I'm making to your audience right now, it can't work if you don't work it. It can't work if you don't work it. Your mission right now is to determine where are you in the grand scheme of life. And the last letter in all of this, not to go through all of them, is live your life with zeal. Relentless enthusiasm is attached to zeal. You zoom into your future. Strive, S-T-R-I-V-E. When I speak about letter S, I tell you, you must strive with big pride for the grand prize of success in your mind, body, and spirit. Tyler and I agree. You're not going to find all that balance, but I'm here to tell you this. 
If you pay attention to just your body and don't expand your mind, imbalance. If you just spend the time meditating all the time, but not mentally expanding, imbalance. But if you just put a little energy into each of those areas, ask yourself questions. Look at the man and the woman in the mirror every day. Do you like what you see? Tyler can tell you. He doesn't know the inspiration he's been to me. This man lost 100 pounds. And I can tell you, Tyler, I love you before and after pictures. I, I can see it all in your pictures. I can see it in your swag, my man. So I, I got you. I, I know exactly where you're coming from. And you're an inspiration. When you told me you ran an ultra marathon and you told me your son was out there with you, Dad, I just wanted to support you. They went to sleep and woke up with you the next day. I don't want to tell you how many times my wife was with me right now. And one of the biggest pictures we got in our lives is me finishing that New York marathon at the age of 50, so going there to celebrate my 50th birthday, realizing what I went through, but I went through the same thing. It was only pain if I let, it let my brain tell me that, tell my body that. So I say to all of the listeners today, I say to you respectfully, no matter what happens, never quit. Letter in tells you to never quit. Get up every day and function at your maximum potential. When I titled this book this, when I titled it Activate or Stagnate, there's one section in this book that's right on this page, child, and I got about 30 seconds, and I really wanted to share it with the kids. Just read this. I just so that way I don't have to speculate whether whether I told them the right thing to do or not. In other words, I don't read nothing because I know it well enough inside of me to say to anyone how it works. And each of us has a different amount of energy to reach our maximum potential. But you see, it's like having a car in park and never pulling that car in drive. And until you take the time to pull your life and drive, until you take the time to put your foot on that accelerator called life and let nothing or no one stop you from living that passion, living that purpose, those infinite possibilities. One door closes, another one opens. And remember, when you live with passion and possibility, your life is in drive, you're going to qualify as you quantify in your quest to be your absolute best. Remember that, qualify as you quantify in your quest to be your act, actually absolute best. Activate or stagnate. And I just thank you guys for the time. I, I, I have all the information necessary. Tyler has it on my websites. Anything I can do, feel free to contact me. Gregory Griffith, anytime you like. You know where I am, you can just Google my name. Greg, do you have time for just one or two quick questions? Oh, sure. No doubt. Sure. So uh, I wanted to get into this because, as you mentioned, we have a lot of similarities. And often people will ask me, well, how do you have find the time to do this? How do you find the time to do that? And one of the things that's interesting about being a teacher is, first, a lot of teachers quit the teaching profession, right? So uh, we have the one of the highest attrition rates of any profession. About 45% quit within the first Correct. five years. And, and that's not to be taken lightly because people don't become teachers on accident. They do it on purpose because they want to teach. But a lot of times they get into the teaching profession and it doesn't align with what they thought they, it would be. It's a lot more work, a lot less pay, underappreciated. So people totally. leave the profession. Well, people like you and I find that we love to teach. And so that passion gets us through. But we also need to make more money because we're not making enough as a teacher. And we're lifelong learners. That's why we became teachers in the first place. So we're interested in a lot of different things. Um, and so you mentioned a few of your things. We talked a little bit about running. Um, we heard a little bit about your entertainment business. But I want to ask you, when people say, well, how do you find the time for it all? How do you answer that? It's a very simple question. Focus. Persistence. Persistence and consistency will give you results. If I decided I wanted to run a marathon at 43, and Tyler, I remember when I couldn't run a mile, I said, you know what, this mile is going to be easy. But if I don't run the first mile, if I don't activate the first mile, it's not going to happen. And no matter what else seems to be an obscured obstacle, I don't let that happen. So to answer that question, you have to find focus. You have to say to yourself, just like Warren Buffett said, you got to know when to say no. Because if you're saying yes to everyone and everything, impossible. Right. And I'll be honest with you. Maybe it did cost me some relationships in my life. You know, this is my second marriage. Maybe after 21 years of marriage and deciding what I need to do at that time of my life, maybe so. But 
when I found the focus with myself physically, and I realized that, oh, this is what happens when you got to get up at four and run before you go to school. Mm -hmm. You've been home already coach cross country. You got to still go run those five or six more miles. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, that's physically. Mentally, when I had to go back to school, man, remember, I'm a dad with a baby. I'm working six nights a week. Let me tell you something, man. What will probably fuel your tank more than anything is desire. If you're focused and you have a desire for something because you know it's going to give your life more stability, it's going to give you more opportunity, there's something about that. And now in retrospect, now at my age and looking back, you, you, I, would just, I would just after that light at the end of the tunnel, if that makes any sense. So yes, that, that, that's what it is. When you find a way when there's no way, the universe will always dance to you. Cool. Well, I, I love that you're involved in so many different things. I want to ask you a question. I haven't asked a guest yet on this show, but I always wonder about it. So you're committed to trying new things and learning throughout your life, and you've, you've been a great example of that. Can you think of one or maybe two books that you've read over the last 30 years that have influenced you to make some of those changes and to do more? Now, you've talked about your book, and, and we'll link to that, but I want to know who else's books have you read that have influenced you? Wow, man. I I have a huge, huge library of different people and different books. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, it's kind of ironic. I, it's so funny you asked me that, and I was upstairs in my library, I got this room that was used to be a guest room, but now it's a library, if you got my job. <laughs> my wife is a book enthusiast, so we got gazillion books, but for the strangers, we, you asked me that. That book just, it, it anchored me. I'm, I'm actually right now, from a religious perspective, or Dr. David Jeremiah, uh, the Jesus that you thought you knew and the Jesus you need to know. I uh, believe me, I speak about mind, body, spirit. I'm not here to speak about religion, but I am here to speak about the power within you. So religious books, uh, then, then there are people. I've always been one that when I, it's not even reading books as much as it is seeing someone do something and saying to yourself, wow. Like in my book, I, bought, I wrote about Sarah Robinson. I, I wrote about Derek Jeter. I wrote about Babe Ruth. I wrote about people who against all odds said, I think, yes, I can. So those books, yes, I read a lot of books, a lot of different ones. I don't even have the titles in my head right now, but I'm just here to tell you, man, like, like Joel Osteen is another one. I got several books from Joel Osteen, the, the guy who has the largest church in the United States in Houston, Texas. He has been a great inspiration to me. When this man's mother was about to die from cancer 43 years ago, his dad, what he went through, I mean, his sister, what she went through. My point is this, you know, I can't remember the titles to all these books, but these authors are, are really there. I grew up really a strict, strict Baptist. My mom is 98 years old, man. Mm -hmm. She's still with us. And she basically has been a walking book for me in the sense that if you just want to do something and you love doing it, Gregory, just go out there and do it. So I read uh, uh, Les Brown. He was one of the first motivational speakers that I can't remember the title of his books, but he just, he, he launched me. Uh, Tony Robbins, they launched me. Zig Ziglar. I mean, I'm just telling you, when I was reading books about motivational people, uh, these, these guys were like the ones. And what's the guy I went out to California, man, uh, with my first book. I'm sorry, uh, this kitchen soup old guy you know what oh, i'm yeah. talking jack about. canfield canfield and, and his partner uh -huh. uh, both those guys books their lives what they've been through you know then there are people like them when they've been rejected by everyone nobody will publish them and against all odds so yeah i got man i got so many people <laughs> that that just blow me away that i, I can sit here and rattle them all off td jake's right now one of the most I mean, his books is, he got a book called Crushed. Right now that I'm reading, man, that when you read it and hear what some people have been through, and here he is probably next to Joel Winston, one of the most, and, and then TBN, Laurie Crouch and, and his wife, those guys, man, I guess with this COVID-19 too, I'll be very honest with you, because it's so hot outside in Florida, I can't run much. So I've been spending a lot of time in here, man. Yep. A lot of time in here, a lot of time trying to understand this. I've been swimming a half mile to a mile in my pool every other day, too. So, you yeah. know, that, so uh, to answer the question real simply, man, there are a multiplicity of people. And I hope yeah. I 
kind of narrowed it down because oh, I know you knew a lot of the guys I mentioned. The, you know, honestly, I didn't even know if you are a reader. I suspected you were. And the reason I asked the question is because this is often the case. When you talk to people who are incredibly busy, when they're doing things, when they're starting businesses, when they're teaching kids and doing all the good things in the world that you're doing, you would think they wouldn't have enough time to read a book. But as you just showed, reading is an important part of your life. And that's a good lesson to the students out there. If you no want doubt. to be more productive, if you want to get more done, if you want to have more success, be a reader because it That's makes right. a difference. I mean, you got to understand something. Our predecessors paved the road for us, you know, and me being an African-American man from where I come from, even, even reading about Harriet Tubman, man, even Madam C.J. Walker, that was this, this, this autobiography on Netflix about what people have gone through to be where they are at. And even, even when I read about the, the Tulsa, Oklahoma situation where, you know, they had this black Wall Street there, and how many young black African-American entrepreneurs were just driven against all odds to say, I think I can. And most of the books I read, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, sure, they, uh, uh, Maxwell, the, the guy in leadership, his name is Maxwell, he's another one. These, they're, they're always speaking about things, and then there's simple things people talk about. There's a guy named uh, Andre Harrell is his name. He wrote a book called Attitude is Everything. It's a simple little book, man. And, and Who Stole My Cheese is another little simple book. Are you familiar yeah. with that one? These yeah. little books, man, you may be tired, you may be burnt out, but if you stop, and what I found that's important for me, structure is around the word focus. When I know I have to read, and, and remember now, we're educators. I also have a financial services license. And I know my wife can tell you what I went through teaching full-time, performing full-time. My dad, matter of fact, this summer, my friend, makes six years. It was, it was the summer of 2014. My dad was 87 years old. And to make a long story short, that's the same year I decided, okay, I'm doing things with this. I'm doing things with that. I'm about to retire. I need to learn a lot more about this, this retirement, this alternatives in insurance. And I just decided to get, get a license in, in, in financial planning, man. And believe it or not, she thought I was crazy. She said, how are you going to find the time to do that? I said, you know something? I think I can. So no, to, to any book that would inspire anyone to, to just go, just like my cross-country team would say to me, I had a slogan that was on the back of all of our shirts. They loved it. It simply said, empty the tank. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling me on that, Tyler? Yeah. Empty the tank. Empty if you come across the line when you're through and you don't feel tired, shame on you. <laughs> it's simple as that. You must empty the tank. And it's the same thing about who you are, where you are now, and where you like to be. There is a price to pay. They all say we have to go through to get to. So books I've read, the people who inspired me, man, none of them. They, they, this guy was saying, man, you got to be on the grind if you want me to get just, just down to basics. You got to stay on the grind. I'm sure you watched The Last Dance. I'm sure you, 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 can, you can talk about Michael Jordan in any capacity you want. But that guy didn't even make the basketball team in 11th grade and went on to become the greatest guy to touch the ball, arguably. What's the point? He didn't quit. He knew he wanted it. His mother said, if you want it that bad, focus, 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 get back after it. And let me tell you something. As much as I knew about Michael Jordan, but when, when that, that documentary came on, I don't know if you had a chance to watch it totally together. Yeah. Do yourself a favor. It really, really will give you something that will fire you up about, how do I say this? I call it ATAC. Have the audacity. Have the ability. That A tag, A T A C. Activate, be tenacious, have the audacity to function in the capacity. And when you read people, when you hear people, when you see people who have done what you and I know what we're trying to do, hey, I, I, I've learned, man. And my, my 60th birthday for me was probably one of the most prolific times of my life. Because that same year, my dad passed away at 87. And it's a long story we can't even get into right now. I never knew my biological father until I was 50 years old. Hmm. I had 10 years of my life with him, from the age of 50 to the age of 60. And long story short about that, I got a lot of things genetically that I cannot change. A retired colonel, a pharmacist, 
the, the fraternity that I'm in right now, he's in the same fraternity. My dad, who I didn't even know till I was 50, was in the same march of man I was in in Tampa, Florida. The same professor who taught the profession 50 years got a chance to teach me too. My point is this, we're wired innately. Tyler, the things you got from your mom and dad, I don't even know them, but no matter what, you are not going to be able to change those things. Of course, we're products of our environment to a certain extent, but genetically, DNA, there's just certain things in us, man, that when we activate them, it's something about the universe. And that guy Zig Ziglar said that too. He said, he said, and the rest of the story. Once you start, there is the rest of the story. And I don't know if you read Michelle, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, that book on President Obama's first lady there. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, pick it up because she talks about something that we're talking about right now. And I'm gonna leave you with this. Everybody's story is important. Everyone's got a story they need to tell. And you believe it or not, we'll have two words I tell my kids when we're in the classroom. Everybody can do something to jump up and down and have impact and inspiration. And I said, you jump up and down on your platform, but the most things people are gonna realize is your impact, your impact. Your legacy is your impact. Your legacy is your inspiration. And I'm humbled that as a teacher, and I've shared with you earlier in our conversation, man, when someone comes back to me I haven't seen in 15 years, or someone just calls me out of the blue, I'm sure you've had those because you shared those also, Tyler. It, it, it makes all the difference, man. Absolutely. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fun to hear from your experiences and your wisdom. Yes. Um, we'll go ahead and link up in the show notes to, to your book and your website. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. God be with you. Thank you.